Hello, I'm Gail Steinhardt. I'm in the research group at Invest in Open Infrastructure. We're a nonprofit uh, that works to improve investment in and adoption of open infrastructure that supports research and scholarship. And it is my true pleasure to introduce to you today our 2024 State of Open Infrastructure report coming out at the end of May. I want to begin by acknowledging a really stellar team of smart, hardworking, and creative people that um, brought this whole thing to fruition, as well as the financial support of the Mellon Foundation, the Arcadia Fund, and IOI Sustaining Circle members. The objectives of the report are multiple. We aim to raise the profile of open infrastructure as a community good and a sound choice for adoption. We aim to eliminate patterns in funding and areas of need. We're establishing a baseline of information that we can update and analyze annually. We are investigating selected topics of potential interest to the open infrastructure community. And wherever we can, we identify possible courses of action to improve adoption and resourcing for open infrastructure. Uh, we take on a lot of topics in this report, beginning with an analysis of characteristics of the infrastructures that appear in our application InfraFinder. It's a tool meant to aid in decision making around open infrastructure adoption. We released it last month, and I invite you to check it out at the URL or the QR code on the slide. And for a more in-depth introduction to InfraFinder, if you look in the February batch of CNI project briefings, Chris Wu, our product lead, gave a talk on it then. Uh, we, we take a look at grant funding for open infrastructure, and that's what I'll talk about today. I'll share a couple of key findings from that research. We take a look at open infrastructure governance. I think this is a really interesting examination of how these groups organize their governance as well as uh, the degree of overlap and representation on governing groups by individuals and institutions. We take a look at trends in open infrastructure performance and adoption, and I think you'll find there some inspiring success stories, as well as some interesting reflections on organizational transitions. We take a look at regional policy developments in open science and open research and their implications for open infrastructure. There's a lot happening in the US right now on the heels of the Nelson memo coming out in 2022, but we also wanted to look at policy evolution in other geographic contexts. And so we do in Europe, Latin America, and Africa. There's more to say there than we could include in this report. So not long after this report comes out, you can expect a much more in-depth look at policy developments in those parts of the world. As a special topic, we looked at uh, influence, the potential influence of procurement and IT governance policy and process on the adoption of open infrastructure and higher education. And then we wrap up with the future signals section, the title of which and the idea for we borrowed from our colleagues at Nesta, but it's a, it's a series of informal takes on topics of interest to IOI staff. So in this edition, that includes a short piece on artificial intelligence, diamond open access publishing, and digital sovereignty. So that's an overview of what's coming in the report. Uh, so for today, let me say a little bit more about the grant funding research. I always looked into this before, um, but we wanted to extend and update that work. It is not an easy thing to do because there's no single comprehensive and open source of grant award data. There's some uh, valuable resources in this area for example, the open funder registry uh, under the uh, stewardship of Crossref is a terrific resource where award information is inferred from funding acknowledgements in uh, papers with DOIs. Unfortunately, for our purposes, infrastructure awards don't always lead to publication, and so infrastructure awards are probably underrepresented in that data set. Um, but even if there were a magical unified source of award data, it's no small thing to retrieve the awards that you want uh, from it. So we really need to figure to we needed to figure out a, a rational starting point and scope for this work. And we did that by deciding to target the infrastructures in InfraFinder. And there were 57 in the first release of InfraFinder. That might sound kind of limiting, and it is. 
But the thing that's compelling about taking this approach is that we can take the data in InfraFinder, additional characteristics of infrastructures, and combine it with the grant funding data to tell some more interesting stories about what's going on. We also just had to target a, a selection of funders. So we have the funders that we identified in the 2022 data set from IOI. With uh, the InfraFinder work, we also we asked participants about recent grant awards. So we were able to update our list of funders. Then we prioritized them according to their activity in the sector. And we just started at the top and worked our way down. So we used uh, the funders data directly. We, we would scrape the entire corpus from their website if we could. <laughs> and we also looked at um, open air, which aggregates funding from a number of sources. And then uh, that resulted in a, in a pretty big data set. We had to then sort through that for awards of interest, which we did by searching uh, or querying title and award abstract or description for the names of open infrastructures and name variants. And um, that worked pretty well, but you can also imagine how there are either a lot of false positives or some infrastructures that are just hard to identify. So if, a, if the name of an infrastructure is a word that is really not a distinctive word, it's very hard to find their award data. Uh, core, the, the repository aggregator in the UK being a great example of that. The English language word core, C-O-R-E, is not very distinctive and not very useful as a search term. Um, similarly, where the name of an infrastructure is embedded in a, in a longer word, cross-ref in cross-reference, or dspace in headspace, we would get false positives. So we, um, we knocked that out and or refined our search strategies to, to take into account uh, words within words. Um, and then because we looked both at open air and funder data, we had to do some significant deduplication of records as well. But once we had that clean data set, then we could take those awards and we categorized them according to the kinds of activities that they were supporting, um, converted currency to US dollars so that we could add things up and added information from InfraFinder. In, in this case, in InfraFinder speak, it's solution category. What kind of infrastructure is this? Is it a repository? system? Is it a publishing system? Is it persistent identifier service or a standard? Um, so we added that information into the grants data set as well. Um, so to, to give you just two nuggets from the funding research, and then I'll tell you how we arrived at those conclusions. My, the two takeaways for you today are open infrastructures are named explicitly in many, many grants that do not go to them directly. And this it won't come as a surprise when you sort of see the examples of this, but it wasn't something we were anticipating or looking for, and it isn't something that we included in our the previous analysis that we did. The other nugget, again, also not a surprise, but always interesting to see conventional wisdom supported by data, is that funders do prefer to support innovation over operations. There's a lot of other things that can be done um, with the data, and we do some of them in the report, we hope to see what other people do with the data as well. So how did we arrive at those conclusions? Well, first, let me just give you kind of a, a feel for the, the size of the resulting data set. So remember, we imposed some fairly significant constraints looking for just a certain set of infrastructures, some of which are really hard to find. <laughs> um, and looking at just certain funders and not necessarily being to get data for all of them. Uh, still, in spite of those constraints, we have a, a, a data set that amounts to more than $400 million US, more than 500 grant awards from 23 funders to 36 different infrastructures. And as I mentioned, we do categorize them according to the activities that are being supported. There are a couple meta categories that I'll start with. The first being direct support, awards that flow directly to open infrastructure of one uh, one or another. And then uh, these indirect awards, which are mentions of infrastructure in the title or abstract, but money that doesn't flow directly to the infrastructure. And then there's a third category that I won't really talk about today, but that's a category that supports adoption of a particular infrastructure or technology to support some work. Here's a graphical depiction of that breakdown. So 42% of the award dollars in our data set flow directly to the infrastructures we're interested in. 
slightly more than half of those dollars are using that infrastructure in some way, but not flowing directly to the infrastructure. And then smaller amounts for words for adoption or that we just simply were not able to categorize. Let's talk first about indirect support because it's the largest of the categories. And we further break that down into uh, a, a word types that I'll call use and adjacent. Use awards you can think of as end uses of an infrastructure. So these are all quotes pulled from uh, award abstracts or descriptions. And the investigator is saying they're going to disseminate their preprints via archive, or they're going to apply Creative Commons licenses to their research outputs. They're going to share their data sets via Dryad. End user uh, dependence on an infrastructure that's specifically named uh, right up front in a, in a research grant. The awards we've characterized as adjacent make somewhat more substantial use of infrastructure. So it might be building something new on top of an existing infrastructure, but not necessarily in direct collaboration with it, not necessarily contributing that new development back to the community code base, but utterly dependent upon its existence. Again, three examples that I've pulled from abstracts or project descriptions, naming archival resource keys, IIIF and Open Alex as, as infrastructures that were absolutely essential for these awards to be made. Um, and I mentioned, you know, the first two are examples of building something new on top of existing infrastructure. The other use we're characterizing as adjacent is when the infrastructure is providing an entire corpus of information that's leveraged for research. And Archive and Open Alex are really commonly named examples of research where we're, we're gonna look at the entire corpus and draw some conclusions. Um, and those awards are not going to archive or open Alex. So these are the top infrastructures that are named in those awards that are not flowing to infrastructure. Uh, and I, you know, I think it's interesting, the numbers are interesting, but this is probably a vast underestimate of all the intended uses because remember we searched only title and abstract I would expect these mentions of infrastructures to be even more common in the body of a grant proposal or in its data management and sharing plan. Um, so that, you know, this, this is interesting, but it's probably even more stark than we realize. Um, but so what, you know, I mean, the point of open infrastructure is for it to be used. This is not meant to be a gotcha moment or finding and calling out free riders. In fact, this kind of use can lead the institutions where these researchers are based to become contributing members of different uh, infrastructure organizations. But the key is that it doesn't have to, and, and we don't know. So we don't know what these end user and adjacent uses mean for the sustainability of open infrastructure. What I think is also interesting uh, here is the impact that these infrastructures clearly have in the landscape of research and scholarship uh, in, in, in a way that it adds up to a lot of money, a lot of research funding flowing to work that's dependent on the existence of these infrastructures. So a couple interesting findings around indirect support. What about direct support? <clears throat> the direct support categories that we identified include community building work, uh, events, other kinds of events and travel, day-to-day -day operations, activities that we either couldn't quite categorize or were too, were not common enough to warrant their own category, that's other, um, research and development and strategy, governance, business planning type activities. Uh, in this figure, I've organized those according to the type of infrastructure to which those awards were made. In all cases, for every type of in infrastructure, the orange segment, which represents research and development, is the largest, you know, gets the, gets the greatest number of awards and also gets the greatest number of award dollars. Doesn't matter how you look at it in this case. Um, operations is always significantly smaller. It's not always trivial, though, but I will say that a closer look at the data shows it's driven largely by sustained investment in Europe PMC and open science framework in particular, that operational support is not terribly evenly distributed across uh, the infrastructures that we looked at. But this is why we say that we that funders seem to prefer innovation over supporting uh, operations. That's not to say that grant funding is the optimal way to support operations, but 
um, when we asked the participating infrastructures in InfraFinder what their most pressing funding needs were, they were operational. They were sustaining the day-to-day -day operations of a service. They were patching and updating software, not shiny new features necessarily, but, but just kind of keeping things running. So um, again, grant funding isn't necessarily the optimal way to sustain operations, but I think we are seeing maybe a little bit of a disconnect between what infrastructures say they need and the resources that they're able to recruit. So just a couple tidbits from the funding research. What's next? Expect the full report to come out at the end of May, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as the data as a, long, as a downloadable data set and some interactive dashboards that will allow you to slice and dice and, and interact with the data in a, in a fun way. Um, we are planning a series of community conversations, one per section, and I hope to see or meet some of you there. If you'd like to be kept informed of those uh, conversations as they're scheduled, please sign up for a state of open infrastructure mailing list, which you can do at this QR code. Please also don't hesitate to get in touch with me directly via email if you have questions or comments or thoughts you want to share. And I thank you for your attention.